you want... Oh, wow. It's, that's, that's how it is at the moment. I'm... Les. Oh, my God. Do you, do you really want me to sit in the middle and break you guys? We're up? having a break at the moment. <laughs> Sophie and I. We're having some disagreements. So. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll sit right here. Are you sure about that? Between the two of them? Yeah? You're in the line of fire. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, Richard doesn't need to be on the stage. Do, should he just... Do you need Richard here? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> 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 that didn't go well for you, did it, Sophie? Have any of you been to New Orleans yet? Yeah. 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 Um, so I haven't quite acclimatised to New Orleans yet. I haven't seen much of it. Came straight here this morning, but I might, uh, I'm, I'm planning on, on, on getting around and seeing a bit of the town. I've heard many great things about it, so I'm looking forward to it. Good, good. Happy birthday! What? Happy, Happy birthday! birthday! I, can't, I can't hear you. <laughs> Happy birthday! Oh, you guys! He uh, wants you to sing, is what he's asking for. What? You want to sing? No. Yeah. What? Why would you say that? Yeah. I'm not All right, saying that. Alright, here we go. We're going to do it. No, we're not do yes, we are. On the count of three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Ah, you guys, thank you. I love you. Can I, I see a little you. tear in the corner of your eye? Yeah, there is. Oh. You're, you're turning 23, right? 45. Yeah. 25. <laughs> that's, that's what I thought. So you guys get to travel around to a lot of comic cons, a lot of cool places. What are, what fandoms are you obsessed with? Like, what are you really into? Outlander. Out yeah! <laughs> uh, Outlander. Woo! Outlander. Yeah. I've heard of it. I've heard Thanks, of it. Man. Yeah, I hear you really like that Brianna character. Oh my god. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I don't know actually. I mean, I'm, I, I do watch a lot of television, but I can't say that I'm, I can't say that I'm really into one fandom or another. I don't think. I'm a big Walking Dead fan. Yeah. There's a few of them wandering around. Them. <laughs> 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 Whatever. Um, we got Matt Mickelson's here at the con as well. And uh, he sat down at our table earlier in the green room and I was like, I don't know what to say. So, um, yeah, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm a fan of a few shows. What about, what about any of you? Are you obsessed with anything in particular? Not TV shows, necessarily. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Like... No. No? I, I mean, I watch stuff and then I move on to the next one. So I really admire your dedication to one show for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as loyal, maybe. I don't know. You just get bored easily, right? True. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Uh, any of you? No, I actually don't have time to watch television. <laughs> <laughs> She's writing. I, uh, you know. I imagine you don't have time to do a whole lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not obsessed with it, but I've started watching uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So yes! Woo! Woo! It's so good. So, um, I mean, yeah. They were here, that would be cool. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kind of curious, just what, what you guys are interested in, too. I want to get to these fan questions out here because we do have a lot of people lined up. So let's go ahead and uh, start right up there because the first person was lined up right over there. So, Welcome to Louisiana. Y'all, please be sure to have some crawfish while you're here. <laughs> My question is for Diana. Um, I've been reading the books, and I just have one question. You use the word abstracted or abstracting, where I might have used distracted. I've just wondered why you chose to use that word. Uh, to abstract, uh, well, it's got two meanings. It's, pardon the pedantry. Abstract means either to draw out of or to draw something or to draw away from. And if someone's speaking abstractedly, they've drawn away into their own mind, whereas they're concentrating on something else. To be distracted means you were trying to pay attention to this and then something else happened. And dis means to, you know, to make a, a disjunction right. between the two. So there's a, a very subtle mean, difference of meaning. Um, thank you. Can you also tell us about the Outlander, the musical? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I don't know is, is the answer there. Um, some years ago, a nice gentleman uh, from Scotland named Mike Gibb came to me and said, I would, I've fallen in love with your Outlander. I uh, have made you know a number of plays uh, to have been successful in you know, small things. And I have a, a, a musician partner who would love to do the music. And we would love to do Outlander the musical. And I laughed and I said, sure. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, really. He said, what we have in mind is to do a, a song cycle of 12 songs that would sort of pinpoint the highlights of the play and then use that as sort of a attention getting fundraising mechanism um, being a Scotty was all in about getting the government to pay for it. And uh, I said, <laughs> yeah, all right, go ahead. So we drew up a bit of a contract and they did. They, they made a, a very nice uh, CD of it, which is called Outlander the Musical. And if any of you had bought first editions of the Outlandish Companion, you would have found an embedded CD in the book, which had the first three songs from that song cycle. Uh, you can still get them online, I think, from Mike himself. But we had to kind of put that in abeyance when we got the contract for the TV show because all of the rights and so forth. But we did reserve those rights. And so just lately we have had a lot of uh, renewed interest in, uh, in making Outlander the musical from you know, more than one quarter. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> good question, good question. We'll jump right over here. So I just want to say thank you to Thank you to all of you for devoting so much of yourselves to bringing these amazingly written characters to life. Um, with all the different shooting locations, which has been your favorite and also which has been the most challenging? And I guess this is a question to the entire group. Um. Um, I think one of the most challenging locations was in uh, the forest, the scene where Sam and I are walking through the forest talking about Do You Hate Me, Dar? and all that one that was in the latest episode. Um, because we actually shot that, that scene was so tainted. The first time we went to shoot it, Sam was sick, so we didn't do it, and we did something else that day, Sam went home. The second day we went to shoot it, it was the worst snow that Scotland had seen for I think like 23 years. It was a big snowstorm, and it was freezing cold, and obviously our outfits are kind of set for spring. Um, so we were really cold, but we managed to power through it because it's about a six page scene. Um, and there were even times where um, one of our DOPs, our DOP was kind of so cold that he sort of had to, he held up his hands, he was like, I can't hold the camera, I'm too cold, we're gonna have to start again. Um, so we shot the whole thing, finally got through it, really relieved. Sam was like, that's the worst day we've ever, ever had an Outlander. And then we got a call to say, we're gonna have to reshoot the whole thing because the oh. continuity of the snow, you can tell that like it's been too long throughout the day. So we reshot the whole thing for the third time. Oh, yeah. oh, I saw the dailies for all of that. <laughs> yeah. And the last one, you know, it's shot from a distance, and uh, Jimmy and Brianna are, of course, talking to each other as they're walking along, but you don't hear them until they get closer. But you're supposed to be in conversation. And so uh, Sam was just sort of riffing along with it. <laughs> and he's saying, So, you've been having a good time last night out with that Roger. <laughs> <I'm getting Rogered. laughs> so, anyway, it just went on all the way down the hill. And I wrote to him afterwards. And I said, funniest bee hunting scene ever. <laughs> to which he replied, oh my god. <laughs> I think one of the most challenging locations for me was um, shooting at the Stones. It must have been around about the same time. Yeah, the same day. Because it, 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 it got to as low as minus 11. Oh my. Uh. And we were out in, in the Scottish countryside out shooting the scene where Roger was through the Stones. And there was a part of it. In the original draft of that scene, some stuff happens while Lord Roger ends up on the ground in front of the Stones. And I spent a long, long time on the ground. And I, I ended up just staying there in between takes because it was too much hassle to try and try and not wander around. And the, 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 the ground was utterly frozen solid and it had penetrated me to the very core. I've never been so cold in my life. And I was, I was violently shaking. It was, it was horrific. Um, so that was probably one of the most challenging. Um, but you were wearing clothes, at least, weren't you? <laughs> and I, was I mean, I, I seem to remember a scene in which my character was on the on the ground for a while, but without any. Your clothes. character's always on the ground, Lotta. <laughs> <laughs> or in various states of undress. Yeah, true. <laughs> was, so you have nothing to complain, really. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't complain. I'm sorry. I apologise. Loads, 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 and loads of locations I've loved filming at. I think it was season two. We had a lot of stuff. Um, we had Loch Catron, which was really nice, where they had a little picnic and driving around in the car. We had a lot of fun doing that. There's scenes, there's stuff yet to come, which is one of my favourite sets. Um, sets, not 
you know, we've yet to visit, which is coming up later on in the season. That was uh, that was a lot of fun, beautiful. I mean, our guys do such a great uh, job on the sets and the yeah. detail that they, that they put in. It's incredible. So, yeah, I've, I've, we've been very fortunate with the locations in our, in our set design. I stumbled upon uh, Rose Hall, which I didn't actually know it still existed in Jamaica. Because yep. we shot that in South Africa, right? Yep. And so then I went to Jamaica a couple of weeks ago for a holiday. Mm -hmm. And we got there, and it was dark at night, and we were driven to the resort. And the guy was like, so yeah, on the right you see uh, Rose Hall. And I'm like, wait, stop. Is that <laughs> actually still a place? And yes. so I went to take a little tour, because they did a sort of animated tour with, you know, all kinds of ghosts appearing while the tour guide is telling you about the place and all kinds of, you know, dead people walking about the place. And it was, um, it was really quite magical. And they told us everything about the White Witch. And then I was like, well, that's where you got your inspiration for real. You don't it think was... I make this stuff up, do you? <laughs> <laughs> it was really magical and I had no idea it was still a, still a place, but yeah. Glad I uh, stumbled upon that. Yeah. Right over here. Um, my question for the actors is um, what you've done so far in the show, what's been your most difficult emotional scene to shoot? And for Diana, what's been the most difficult scene for you to write? Leaving Fiona was definitely <laughs> emotionally funny. Leaving her the stories and stuff in the house. There's a, there's a deep, there's a deep, deep love there, and you know it was really hard to leave her and say goodbye to her. In the house. I think my hardest scene was reuniting with Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm okay. laughs> Dying? I don't know. I've never done it, so yeah, no inspiration there, but I'm dead. Oh, I don't know. It depends what you mean by hard. If you mean emotionally difficult, those are things that I, I sort of see coming. You know, I know there's this this thing, but I don't think about it too much ahead of time. I don't plan it at all. I can't write those until something happens that I call when the words show up. You know, just suddenly I will get a little phrase. It may be something from someone's <coughs> thoughts, something someone said, but I hear that that phrase, that sentence. I hear it physically, and uh, I can write that down, and then it just sort of bursts loose, and I will go through it and you know write it usually in one uh, one. One, one go, just with tears running down my face. <laughs> but there's a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but the books so far, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. <laughs> right up here. Jinkies, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> my name is Velma. <laughs> um, I have a question for Diana. Why does Claire still wear Frank's wedding ring even <laughs> after he died? Because she loved him. What else? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's an uncommon thing for people to still wear Yeah, wedding of course they do, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah no, my mother died uh, when I was 19. After 20 years of marriage, my dad wore her wedding ring the rest of his life. Okay, thank you very much. Right here? Hi, um... Wow. Um, no, I just really wanted to thank you all, um, not only for the book series, but for bringing it to life. Um, in 2017, my mom passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly, and since then it's been really hard um, just to connect with my, my dad. He's been drawn back, we've all been drawn back, it, it hit us very hard, and it's not something, we, we try to have conversations and we're tiptoeing around each other because we don't want to upset each other. But one thing we've been able to bond over is Outlander. Um, I found out he was watching the show. I was watching the show and reading the books. So now it's something um, he'll ask me, you know, well, how did it happen in the book? Or did they change this from the book? And we'll talk about why it may have happened differently in the show or, um, or even things historically. He goes, oh, I, I read a, about this weapon or this tool and I looked it up and it's really, it's real. And it's just something we've been able to bond over um, and gives us, a way to reconnect, so I just wanted to thank you all for that. Hi, uh, this is for Richard. Uh, hello. Where, where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> hello. Hi, I'm Laura Lee. Uh, my question is, um, in the most previous episode, you had your first meeting with Jamie, uh -huh. and that was a pretty <laughs> intense scene to watch. Yeah. Do you use a body double uh, when you're under these fight scenes, or is it all you because it was really good? 
No, that was all me. That was all me. Um, yeah, no, that was that was that was, that was a lot of fun. That's not. I'd imagine quite how Roger had anticipated meeting his father-in-law for the first time. But hey, you know, each their own. No, we, we shot that for a couple of days, I think, and um, it was quite. I remember it feeling quite brutal, even though obviously it's choreographed and we have a stage fighter and, and all the rest of it. And we'd shot. We did. We done quite a lot of coverage, quite a lot of shots on it. Um, but it was fine. It was a lot of fun. That was that's, that was my first time working with Sam. But I, tend, I try not to use a body double or a stunt double as much as possible. There's some stuff in the episode coming where I may have a little fall or whatever. Um, and I tend to try and do as much of that stuff as they'll let me. Um, which turns out isn't a lot. <laughs> we'll go right over here, back to you, Ben. Okay, um, first I would like to say how absolutely thrilled I was to see Murtaugh after Collide. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, if you could fall through the stones and go back in time, where would you go? Or when would you go, rather? Um, to the, can I go to the beginning of time? Is that allowed? If I could be in like a little bubble? Just to go back and see what when, the deal when was is. that, the beginning of time? Yeah. Well, I'd imagine the Big Bang, right? Just the beginning of time. When, every, when, when creation begins, the point of creation, the very point of creation coming into being, just to see what actually happened, you know. There's a little bit of research for myself. If that's allowed, if I'm able to survive that, then that's, that's where I want to go. I feel like we, we get asked this a lot, to be honest, and, uh, and I should be saying something different every time because I get all these opportunities, but I'm going to say the future again, because, um, you know, to a future that I might not live in, like far future. Um, just to see what it's like if we're still around, you know? That would be cool. Um, yeah, when we get asked it, sometimes I say the 20s just because I think after the war, the boom, they kind of speak easier. The be clothes, really cool. let's be honest. The clothes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but then actually, I did think once to go back and see the pyramids just to see how they were actually built and the sort of history surrounding those I think would be really cool. Egyptian era. Well, it's always fun to you know, go back and see the origin of things. I figured I'd like to go back to about 3200 BC, which is when writing was invented. And I'd like to see just how that took people. They were thinking, but I can make marks here and you know what I said. And that, uh, yeah, just to see how that worked. That's a good question. I like that one. Thank you. With me? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, my question for Miss Diana. I love to write. How did you get started as a professional author? How do you get started as a professional writer? Uh, basically, you write something. I mean, it's, it's as easy and as hard as that. Uh, writing is both really simple and completely impossible. But, you know, come down to it, all it is is words on a page. You know, you can write it, you can type it, whatever. But as long as you get words on a page, you know, this is writing. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. People take classes and they read books and they go to seminars. You can do that, but none of that will make you a writer. The only thing that uh, makes you a writer is to put words on the page. And you don't need anyone to, to tell you how to do that. Um, you do need to read because that's, this is the, I got three rules for becoming a writer is what it comes down to. Number one is read, read everything, read lots of it. Because this is how you decide what it is you like yourself. You're wasting your time to read, uh, to write stuff that you don't personally like just because you think it might sell. It won't and, it, and you won't enjoy it. So write something you really want to write. And also reading teaches you kind of the rudiments of what good writing looks like. You read two books and you think, well, these are both really good books, but uh, I like this one much more than the other one. Why is that? Well, I like the characters here. They seem like real people. These people seem kind of you know, stiff and wooden. Why is that? Well, I think it's the way these people talk. You know, they're kind of more natural. These people keep telling me stuff that they already know. And, and here you have learned uh, the first rules of dialogue. Keep it short and don't tell people stuff they already know. And so by reading and just observing, you will learn what the patterns of good writing are. So number one is read. Number two is write. Because, uh, you know, I always tell people ballerinas aren't born on their toes. Nobody is born learning how to write or being a writer. Some people have a little more natural talent than others or a little more luck. But uh, the more you do it, the better you get is what it comes down to. So number one is read. Number two is write. And the third one is the most important. Don't stop. Good luck. Can, can I ask you a question, Diana? Yeah. Do, you, do you think that everybody can be a writer, or does it, does it just take practice or also talent? 
uh, talent really helps. But uh, you, yeah, anybody could be a writer. The question is, what do you want to write? You know, some people write greeting cards, and they're really, really good at it, but they could not write a novel to save their lives. Some people write song lyrics or poetry and so forth, and they find it very, uh, you know, uh, personally fulfilling, but they're not selling it. They're not expecting to make a living from it. And, you know, it's what do you want to do with writing? It's, it's an expression of yourself, of your soul. And, you know, in some instances that can be commercial, you may be able to make a lot of money out of it. That's where the luck comes in for the most part. But yeah, anyone can write. I mean, uh, I <laughs> was gonna say, unless you have some uh, form of what they call print handicapness, but even that shouldn't stop you. I know, uh, I know a, a 10 year old dyslexic girl who wrote her own book uh, called The Dyslexic Warrior about you know, learning to read and write even though dyslexic. So it doesn't, uh, yeah, you can do it. I have a question kind of regarding reading. What do you, uh, maybe advice or um, just your thoughts on like people who have a hard time reading as far as like concentrating on reading? Because I've always kind of been like, I start reading and then my mind just kind of wanders off and I feel like I s mm -hmm. stop paying attention and like I can't focus on the book. Is, is that necessarily because like- I Read like Outlander. Reading? Read yeah. Outlander. <laughs> <laughs> or Read Outlander. <laughs> <laughs> or is that because I'm not reading the right thing? Yeah. Well, that's a possibility. Yeah, you should read books that you enjoy, and you know, not all books are for all people. It may be that you really enjoy, you know, something that's really quick and light. You know, maybe you like thrillers, maybe you like, you know, comic novels. Uh, there's no reason to read The Pillars of the Earth unless that's the kind of book you really like. You know, that, like, it, but it's a good book, that's all I'll say about it. I was going to add a few buts, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I read that one and the sequel to it in order to write a book review of the sequel, which is why I've probably had a little too much, can't follow it. But uh, yeah, it, they're both decent books, but he's got patterns that you become very evident the more you read. Uh -huh. And you realize that basically he wrote the, the outline, which has all the dialogue in it, and then his research assistants filled in these blocks of facts. And you know, so if you want the story, you just read the short lines. Oh. If you want the history, you read the long blocks. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just how he works. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's different ways. But the short answer to what you're really asking is read or listen to audio books <laughs> because that, that uses sense. a different channel in your brain. Yeah. And also you can do other stuff. If you are like me, sort of ADD or ADHD, I cannot do one thing at a time. I need to be doing several different things at the same time. Exactly. And so, you know, I can be walking the dogs and listening to an audio book, you know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, cleaning up my office and listening to an audio book. So, so that may be your problem. And if so, that might help. Perfect, thank you. Hi, I'm Emily Gray from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Thanks to all of you so much for being here and for your work. Uh, I have a question for Diana and one for the cast. Uh, for Diana, in your uh, eight published books in the Outlander series, I'm interested in the theme about siblings. Actually, sharing Outlander has made me closer to my sister. I've noticed that there's a difference between the brothers' relationships, the brother-sister relationships, and the sister relationships. We have some very deep relationships between the brothers, the Grays, the Mackenzies, even the Randalls. Uh, brothers and sisters, we've got a few examples of those, Jamie and Jenny included. But with the sisters, it doesn't seem like we get the same deep adult relationships that we're seeing with some of the brothers. I wondered if that was intentional, and whether it is or not, what do you think it says about the position of women in the 1700s in a male-dominated society? Hmm. Well, in terms of starting from the back end there, uh, I would imagine that female relationships were intensely close during the 18th century and all of these times in which women were essentially domesticated and, you know, they led very confined lives. Also, if you have ever had children, you realize that you really need the company of other women who also have children, you know, to, to share both knowledge and work with and so forth. So there would have been, you know, a very close relationship. The thing is that, um, you can write a really good book about, you know, this sort of domestic thing, you know, the classic woman's life and how people succeed in being uh, their own person despite this and so forth. But that's not the kind of book that I write. I am much more interested in, uh, you know, adventure and the outward life and so forth. And you may notice that Claire is a very independent person and um, she's she says frequently that she feels guilty that she's not doing the back-breaking laundry. But on the other hand, she is the only person who knows how to save lives, so it's better that she does that. 
On the other hand, she's doing that by herself. She's not out there stirring laundry and chatting with everybody else. Then her life tends to set her aside a little bit. Brianna is an only child and so forth, which is more for logistics than anything else. You know, if you handle too many people, it makes it really hard to go back and forth. And also, if you're a time traveler, if you're going and you're leaving this vast family behind, you're gonna have much more of a pull. You'll be wondering, oh my God, you know, has grandma developed dementia? Why am I, why am I not there? That kind of stuff. And this is a distraction to, to the storytelling. So that's one reason. The other reason is that owing to my unorthodox choice of careers, I was a scientist in my previous incarnation. All of my close colleagues and friends were men until I was about 40. And uh, while I do have one sister with whom I am very, very close, I did not have close female friends since about the fourth grade until I was about 42. At this point, I do have a few close female friends, but it, uh, it wasn't it wasn't sort of bred in me. It didn't come naturally, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you so much. Fascinating insights. I appreciate it. Um, for the cast, um, how has you all developed complex characters? How has your decision to read or not read the Outlander series influenced how you've developed your characters? Um, are you a journalist or something? <laughs> <laughs> you have a tone, you have a certain delivery, are you like a public speaker or a journalist? I was just thinking the same yeah, thing. Yeah, right. What do you do? Uh, I'm, I'm a healthcare lawyer and I do public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. I thought you might. Um, I've read, this, I've read the, the book series up until kind of, uh, up until Fire the Cross, which I'll pick up again before we go on season five for, for many reasons. Um, initially it was because when we came in at the end of season two, um, we only had one episode, we only had one episode of material, we only had episode 13 and that was it. Um, which wasn't going to be enough for me and I know, and I understand that they're two separate things, I understand you've got the show and you've got the books. I'm kind of, I like to tread a board between them um, because using the books for me was very helpful uh, to give me an idea of Roger both in season two and where he was headed, what people were going to be expecting of this character and kind of just what makes this character tick and try and get into the character's head even though I had to read ahead of where we were filming it still gave me a good idea and a good platform to start my character development from um, I found it immensely helpful I still do um, and I know that there are there are changes either for logistical or storytelling purposes throughout the season which you know you have to make certain accommodations when you're putting on screen um, I still like to stay true as true as I can to the spirit of the character that, that Diana wrote of Roger because Something that excited me immensely from starting was his journey that he takes, especially through season four and season five, was something I'd always been looking forward to. Um, and I like to stay quite close to that, even if it's just for myself. Even when changes have been made, I still have, I still like to stay connected to that original journey and the changes and the evolution of that character through the rest of the series. So I, f I find it personally, I find it quite helpful, even if there are even if it does deviate. Same thing, I mean, primarily because a lot of our audition scenes actually were from book four. Um, they were sort of dummy sides, or actually the dialogue was just taken from the book, and we just played those scenes out. So I wanted to make sure that I'd read up to that book um, for that reason. But also because I do feel like book four is where we really see Brianna sort of become a woman, and she's kind of, you really have to peel the layers of Brianna to get to know her, so I really wanted to sort of read how, who she becomes and then be able to strip it back to the kind of scenes two and three where we have the kind of younger version of Brie. Um, so same kind of thing really, I don't like to read ahead too much because you, you don't, the character doesn't know where they're going so you don't need to, um, but obviously you want to keep true to the, the book Brie that Diana put on the page. Even when sometimes, like Richard was saying, the scripts, you know, things change and you do have to keep true to the page, otherwise you find yourself kind of pulling against two different characters, but you do want to keep the essence of that, that sort of true book break, so, for the same reasons. Yeah, I don't know, I, I always find it such an interesting term when you say building a character, because I think it's so intuitive, you know, you, you just, you get the pages, whether it's the book or the scripts, and then the way you even read them the first time, the way you first read the first lines of the character, you're going to read them really differently than I would. And so the way you read them is just the first moment the character starts to build. I don't know how much I do consciously and saying, oh, I'm going to make this choice or that. It's just very intuitive. And, and I always feel like with, uh, with Galus, I mean, I was well aware that there was much more material about her. Also, not just the books, but the fans online, the community. I started tapping into them like, whoa, 
kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> then I spoke to the producer, and I said, you guys keep referring to all kinds of stuff in the future. I have no idea. How am I going to play this character if I have, I don't have all this information? I'm a terrible slow reader, so I wasn't even, not even going to start with that. And he said, you know what? You have this character now. You do whatever you want. And I was like, all right. That's cool. I'll do that. Um, and, and it was. I mean, it's just been a really fun, um, especially because Galas has such a fantastic arc throughout the time and different time periods and different ages as well. It's just been really fun and just quite intuitive and really free. Really. It's, it's been great. Thanks so much. It's going to be more fun to read the new book, hear it from Diana, and more fun to watch tomorrow night knowing what went into it with you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very well spoken. We're going to try to get to the rest of the questions as fast as possible. We have just a little bit of time left. Okay, my question is for Diana. Um, how difficult was it for Claire to adapt to the relatively difficult lifestyle of the 1700s? And ultimately, if Jamie uh, were to go back to, forward to the 20th century, do you think he would be able to adapt? Well, Claire uh, comes from a you know, very varied background. She's lived in, you know, semi-wild places, places that the modern world would consider uncivilized, uh, different civilizations, all through her childhood, traveling with her uncle. And that was one reason why she has that background, is because I didn't want somebody who would, you know, have hysterics because she had to use a privy, or, some, or would be asking for the telephone. I mean, I've read books like this, where the first thing your time traveler does is say, oh my God, there's a telephone booth, I need to call someone. <laughs> Or, or, you know, worse. Um, so I, I wanted her to be able to roll with the punches because the first thing that I realized about her was that she had come out of out of war somewhere, and I finally realized that it was World War II that she'd been through. So someone who's been through that as well as that kind of background, they're not going to have trouble, you know, adapting to rough conditions. You know, you look around and you see what you've got. You know, what do I need? You know, what what can I use? You know, we'll use that. You know, and you kind of go from one day to another, and then you know, gradually as you begin to know people, you know what the parameters of your situation are, it becomes more comfortable. But, you know, if any of you have been on, like, a camping trip for two or three weeks, you understand how you completely change from um, your normal life to this is where we are right now, this is what we're going to do today, you know, and uh, it's, it's just like that. Your life evolves around you and you evolve with it. As for Jamie, he's never going to the future, so you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> I knew she was going to say Thank that. You. <laughs> Over here. This is a question for Diana, and it's a pretty hypothetical one. If you, for some reason, were forbidden to write about Outlander or Lord John or how or anything Outlander related, what would you write about, and would you remain a writer? I was born a writer. I've known that I was one since I was about eight years old. So yeah, I would certainly continue to write. Um, as to what, uh, I plan to tell the rest of, Ma of Master, uh, Master Raymond's story eventually. I don't know if you consider him part of Outlander or not. Uh, as to that, I have a lot of ideas. I originally <laughs> I had a contract to write two mystery novels, and I had half the first mystery novel. The uh, trouble was that, well, all of this happened, you know, the, yeah, and kind of pushed that back. And the other thing that happened was that the first novel was centered on border issues, you know, immigration, and was also, uh, the sub-theme was the place of journalism in the world and, you know, how that's changing. The thing is, both those issues are changing so fast that anything I wrote would be obsolete within a year. And I said, I don't want that to happen. So, you know, I kind of put those aside and in fact, I ended up canceling the contracts because the publishers were getting kind of impatient. I said, look, you know, I, I can't see finishing those, you know, anytime in the next two or three years. So let's cancel that. If and when I get to them, I'll talk to you again. So yeah, there's plenty of stuff going on in the, in the back of my mind all of the time. It's just where do you choose to dig? I mean, I didn't start with the idea that Outlander was anything other than a practice novel to uh, learn how to write. It was just, you know, stuff happens. Thank you. How do you survive bronchitis in the 18th century? How do you survive what? I said, here's my question. How do you survive bronchitis in the 18th century? Oh, bronchitis? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, um, Basically what you do is you treat the symptoms of it. You don't have antibiotics other than, if you are Claire, you probably have developed some crude form of penicillin, which might help. But basically you would deal with the, uh, with the symptomology of it. Uh, you would use um, decongestant things. You would use mucus thinning uh, 
herbs and so forth, there are a few of them, uh, for decongestant, you know, menthol, camphorate, uh, camphorated uh, things. Uh, you would use goose grease, you would use mustard plasters, which are kind of out of, out of, uh, out of fashion these days, but they did work because they increased the circulation to your, your chest area, which in turn would help with the, with the decongestion and the irritation of your bronchi. You can take um, a tincture of slippery elm, which will kind of soothe your mucous membranes. It's mostly for your throats, sore throats, and so forth. But your mucosa is, you know, it's, it's all one thing. It flows through your body. And so what decreases inflammation in one part is likely to have at least some effect on the rest. So you would take general anti-inflammatory things, willow bark tea, slippery elm, other things like that. Um, but as I say, it's just treating the symptomology. You have people breathe steam, you put them over a uh, pot of steaming herbs. Rosemary is pretty good for steaming. Um, sweet basil to a certain extent. Um, there's things that you can steep in goose grease or make decoctions of that you use as topical applications. And basically you just want to keep this person breathing as freely as they can until their own immune system is able to overcome whatever, uh, whatever bug is attacking them. But you know, bronchitis, itis actually means an irritation of, so you're having an irritation of the bronchi, so you try to soothe that irritation as much as you can. I would say witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> well, we kind of don't like to say things like that out loud. <laughs> so then people always want to know, well, how? <laughs> You're very smart, by the way. <laughs> I'm just listening to you talk, and I'm like, wow. I went somewhere wrong in life. <laughs> right up here. Hi, Diana. I just have a question on your current book that you're writing. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any insight or spoilers in an expected publish <laughs> Well, I can't tell you spoilers because there's a lot of people here who don't want to hear them. But uh, I will be doing readings tomorrow. And I will read, you know, a number of uh, bits from Drums of Autumn because that's, you know, the current season. But I also will have two or three short bits from uh, Go Tell the Bees that I am gone. So. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, we'll try to get these last two questions. Alrighty. Hi, my name is Patty, and this is for all of you. Um, you all uh, travel all over the world promoting the show, and every time I've seen you guys or seen a video, it's like you always have all this amazing energy, and you've never appeared to have jet lag. What is your secret? <laughs> what a lie. <laughs> Whiskey. Yeah! <laughs> whiskey helps. Sometimes a red wine. Start with red wine. Whiskey, coffee, and melatonin. Yeah. I'm joking, I don't even drink. Um, <laughs> what are you laughing at now? <laughs> you know, that generally helps you get it good. It's always like, exciting to be here, and uh, once you get started, having a bit of banter with the fans. And, being shot in the face by Sophie, that kind of wake the chair up and <laughs> just start getting involved and having a bit of a laugh. That always helps you through your day. These things can be quite good fun there, can be what, what you make of them. Jet lag, you just deal with that later. Try not to think about it because it's there. Just don't think about it because what can you do? That's amazing. Thank you. All right, last question right here. Hi, I'm Kat from Cats and Celts. And I just started a fan group for Caitlin O'Ryan. Woo! Yay! And Sophie and I were talking about it earlier. She plays Lizzie, and I just think she's wonderful. <laughs> Sophie feels the same way. I'm Roger sure. doesn't. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you blew it. Richard, that was my question. Huh? I was going to ask how Roger felt about it. About Lizzie? Yeah. I mean, he hasn't met her yet, has he? But imagine had you known the circumstances you would you, you would be best pleased <laughs> that's given, what i was thinking given where he's ended up so diana him. as far as lizzie goes that and the whole circumstances of how roger ends up in the last episode it, it just seems very almost like a comedy of errors kind of like from shakespeare <laughs> or something like that yes. um, is that kind of what you were going for just that that because to me nobody no one person is to blame. That's so exactly it's, right. It's, it's, you know, it's just one thing after another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. It would have been good if in the show they had managed to, uh, you know, to show uh, Brianna drawing the picture of Roger McKenzie and how Jamie and Ian turn white and so forth. Exactly. Yeah, but, but they did work well, though, so you'll, you'll get to see that. Well, thank you. You're welcome.
thank you all so much for taking the time to come out here and answer questions. It was you are all very, very interesting, and I feel dumb. <laughs> we're very interesting people, very well spoken. So thank you all so much for coming out here. Don't forget to go visit them at their booth. Diana, you're doing a reading tomorrow, right? Yes, yes. So make sure you check that out. Everybody, give it up for Richard, Laura, Sophie, and Diana.